Our guest, Douglas Waller. He is a New York Times bestseller, and of course, he's the author of Wild Bill Donovan, also a correspondent with Time and Newsweek, and covered the CIA and the Pentagon for many years in Washington, D.C. And with that, Mr. Waller, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's good to be here. This is an interesting book. Of course, interesting group of people. Let's start with Wild Bill Donovan, and then we'll go quickly into the four individuals. What was unique about the general, as a matter of fact? Wild Bill Donovan really was a larger-than-life character, which made him a, a great subject for a biography. He was a hero in World War I. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for Heroism in World War I. He uh, became a millionaire Wall Street Republican banker. And during World War II, he headed up Franklin Roosevelt's spy service, the overseas intelligence service that Roosevelt formed, called the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS. This was the precursor to uh, today's CIA. Donovan basically started out that organization with just one guy, and that was himself. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the war, he built that shadow force into over 10,000 espionage agents, commandos, research analysts, propagandists, support personnel scattered in stations overseas all over the world. And, of course, one of the individuals that he had to deal with, in addition to, of course, military command, which, as I read, apparently began to understand the value, was the FBI, Mr. Hoover. Oh, yeah. Donovan liked to say his enemies in Washington were as fierce as Adolf Hitler was in Europe, and that was really the case. He had ferocious battles with J. Edgar Hoover, who was then the director of the FBI. Hoover thought Donovan's organization was the biggest collection of amateurs he'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. And truth be told, it was a collection Whoa. of amateurs in the beginning. It learned basically on the job. You know, many of them, and you, you go to Wild Bill's success on Wall Street, many of them themselves after working in World War II, as, as you point out in your book, went on to private enterprise before coming back to work for the CIA, and in, and in some instances were highly successful. So these are people that had an innate ability. Well, it is, and that's really the, uh, the subject of, the, of my second book, which uh, was just released uh, last week, uh, Disciples. Mm -hmm. It's the story of four uh, OSS operatives who worked for uh, Donovan during the war. It's about their World War II stories. And they also uh, later became directors of the Central Intelligence Agency, among the most controversial directors the CIA has ever had. That we're talking about Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, William Colby, and William Casey. All of them were, obviously, they came from civilian life. Dulles was a lawyer, a former State Department official. Uh, Helms wanted to be a newspaper publisher right. <laughs> uh, before he uh, basically got drafted into the OSS. Colby, uh, after the war, after serving with the OSS, went and got a law degree uh, and was going to be a labor lawyer, but discovered that was boring as anything, and so he went back to the uh, uh, the CIA to fight communists as he fought, as he fought in the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bill Casey was a number cruncher, uh, worked for the Research Institute of America, an analytical think tank in Washington before the war. After uh, serving with Donovan's OSS, he decided he wanted to make his f fortune first before he got back into <laughs> national security work. And then he later became Ronald Reagan's CIA director. Again, uh, the book is, and we're talking about this this evening, Disciples. Of course, I mentioned uh, the other book, Wild Bill Donovan. Douglas Waller, the uh, author, as uh, he just pointed out, released just last week. And when I discovered this, I was jumped quick on the spot. I wanted to chat with you, Mr. Waller, on this uh, subject. You know, let's work our way down besides Bill Donovan. Let's look at each of those four individuals about whom you write, and with not enough time to really get delve into a lot of the details. I do want to start, of course, with Alan Dulles. You know, it's an interesting component. Alan Dull Dulles, head of the CIA, and his brother, John Foster, Secretary of State, if I'm not mistaken. How was that relationship, um, how did that, you know, flow? Well, it, it actually flowed pretty well. Dulles, Alan Dulles, always uh, deferred to Bo uh, Foster uh, when they were young kids. Foster was kind of the leader of, of, the, uh, of the siblings. When they were Secretary of State, 
Incidentally, a lot of people uh, would have preferred to have Alan Dulles as Secretary of State than uh, John Foster Dulles because uh, Foster was so dour and you know morose mm -hmm. and everything. And Dulles was uh, quite a conversationalist, you know, uh, someone that people just pour their hearts out to. But uh, uh, Alan Dulles uh, deferred to uh, John Foster Dulles on foreign policy issues up to a point. Uh, Alan Dulles was involved in an awful lot of uh, major foreign policy issues on the covert side. Uh, you know, he, he engineered the overthrow of the elected uh, prime minister in, in Iran. Uh, he overthrew the government of Guatemala. And, of course, I guess he's most famous for uh, was uh, leading the or launching the calamitous operation to land CIA-trained guerrillas uh, at uh, Cuba's Bay of, Bay of, Tri Pig. uh, Bay Bay of Pigs. Pigs. Yeah. All right. Uh, with that said, you, of course, uh, your book is focused on many of the exploits of these four men. In the process, and I won't go into the details of the exploits, I mentioned Bill Donovan. Of course, he was renowned for working behind enemy lines. The experiences that they had, how much of that shaped what they thought the CIA would be? Because, of course, the OSS was remade as the CIA. As a matter of fact, Harry Truman basically shut down the OSS. In the process of the redevelopment of the CIA, how much of the experiences that these four men went through shaped their management of the CIA? Well, their total experience in World War II had a big impact on how they ran the CIA. And just to back up you know, briefly on what they did in the war, Alan Dulles ran the OSS's most successful spy operation against the Axis mm -hmm. uh, based in uh, Bern, Switzerland. Uh, Bill Casey organized dangerous missions penetrate Nazi Germany with OSS operatives. Bill Colby led uh, daring OSS commando raids into occupied France and Norway. Richard Helms mounted mis uh, risky intelligence programs uh, against the Russians in war tour in Berlin just after the German surrender. Now, it's interesting, none of these four guys talked about their OSS years all that much, but it's clear that uh, World War II had a big impact on their lives. Alan Dulles ran the CIA much as he did the OSS station in Bern, Switzerland. Before the war, Helms wanted to be a newspaper publish, publisher, but the OSS taught him how to be a spy, and after the war, he decided intelligence collection and not the news business was his calling. Bill Colby, who, in fact, he used to wear his floppy fatigue cap from World War II when he tended his garden, quickly uh, grew bored with being a lawyer after the war and joined the CIA to fight the communists. When Casey became CIA director, he hung two pictures in his, Lang his office at Langley headquarters. One was of Ronald Reagan. The other one was of his mentor, Wild Bill Donovan. I know. I thought that was fascinating. All right. In the midst of all of this, and, and of course, going back to the experiences in the CIA, and you've done a great job in, in detailing the experiences of these four men. Yet, interestingly enough, all four of them failed eventually what well, they, I, I mean what is that that's I, I, there's not enough time today to, to focus on each of them but it's just interesting it, it is they, it, they all came a cropper as we say uh, yeah. Dulles had the Bay of Pig scandal Richard Helms was convicted of lying to Congress over the CIA's effort to oust President Salvador Allende in Chile Bill Colby became a pariah among old hands in the agency for releasing to Congress what became known as the Family Jewels Report on CIA misdeeds in the 1950s, mm -hmm. 60s, and early 70s. Bill Casey, near, who was Ronald Reagan's CIA director, nearly brought down the agency and uh, Reagan's pre presidency from the, the program that supplied the Nicaraguan Contras with money raked off from the sale of arms to Iran for hostages in Beirut. This was the Iran-Contra scandal. Mm -hmm. Now, when I, you know, I looked, all four guys had different personalities, different backgrounds and everything, but I did find common threads between them. Uh, number one, they were all smart. I mean, these were smart intelligence men that, uh, who, you know, voracious readers, curious creatures of reason. But they weren't, you know, the, the ivory tower types who are going to sit for long and, you know, in doubtful introspection. These were doers. These were men of action. These were men who believed that they could control history rather than letting them. 
and this is how they approach their jobs. And, of course, this is a different era. They, they all carried their war against Nazism into the war against communism, and, you know, things became different. Things got out of whack for them, and they all came a cropper. Now, keep in mind, the covert operations, the controversial ones they launched, were launched with presidential approval. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the president may have had deniable pl or plausible deniability, but he was in their hand, uh, you know, in lockstep with them. I mean, Kennedy did approve the Bay of Pigs invasion, and Eisenhower uh, approved launching it and the, the overthrow of governments. Uh, Ronald Reagan was certainly behind, uh, you know, Case, Casey's effort to fund the Nicaraguan Contras and uh, circumvent uh, Congress. And Richard Nixon, you know, was certainly, uh, you know, egging on Richard Helms, too. So, I mean, it wasn't like they were all... You know, there's kind of a myth that they all kind of go off on their own. They really didn't. And each individual, of course, also, as you pointed out, their experience in World War II brought with them a different skill set. And one that really caught my attention was that of Richard Helms. Uh, his ability to, if you will, compile a lot of information and then turn it into actionable information that you could really understand. That was a pretty un unique skill. I, I, granted, he was a reporter, but he also had a good time. I, I remember the stories about him. You, you write about him and his experience in Berlin. Each had a separate skill that was unique to them, did they not? Well, it was. Uh, in Richard Helms' case, uh, his reporting experience helped him quite a bit. Actually, his educational background helped him, too. He studied abroad, mm -hmm. lived abroad as a child, studied in very pricey private schools in Switzerland and Germany, which he said was good preparation for a foreign spy. Well, his, his, so, his, uncle, his uncle was a member of the State Department, as I recall? Uh, no, his uncle, uh, 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 Helms' oh. grandfather, grandfather was a guy named Gates McGarra, who was one of the uh, you know, famous international banker. Helms' stint as a reporter gave him the experience of being able to write quickly, concisely, to the point, and clearly, which an intelligence officer needs to do. Alan Dulles really cut his teeth on spying in World War I when he was, he was stationed uh, again in Bern, Switzerland, uh, as, uh, with the legation there as a first secretary. He ended up, by default, becoming its uh, intelligence officer because nobody else was around to do the job. Mm -hmm. Switzerland was a haven for espionage uh, for the warring powers during World War I and World War II. And Helms learned a lot of hard lessons uh, in World War I about a lot of the basics of, uh, I mean, Dulles did, about the basics of spying that he carried over into World War II. Mm -hmm. William Colby was an army brat, mm -hmm. traveled all over the world, wanted to be an officer like his father, and wanted adventure. Uh, and he'd, he'd li he'd, you know, lived in France for a while, when he was in college. So he spoke French, which he needed to do to be part of the operation that he parachuted into France under. And in the case of William Casey, he had worked as a research analyst, able to assemble massive information. He was a good organizer, which is what the OSS desperately needed. <laughs> was it Casey that was he the one had the sponge for a brain? He remembered things? Uh, oh, he did. It, yeah, it, he, had he, a he had a photographic memory. He could he I look, could I, memorize I, things, you know, just flipping through articles or, or, or journal uh, or reports and everything. He, it looked like he just, was just skimming it, but he would have a photographic memory, would, you know, take it all in. I love the comment you write. He, he got upset with subordinates who would report to him things that he remembered them saying two months prior. Well, oh, yeah. you could say it word for word, but they said... Mm -hmm. The book, Disciples, the author, Douglas Waller, and of course, I do mention the other book, Wild Bill Donovan. As we wrap it up here, we're looking at the OSS, which had, for all intents and purposes, a purely military purpose. It did have a role associated with politics, and of course, you also mentioned their efforts in convincing, one portion of the book you mentioned, convincing manufacturers to, if you will, assist the allies and giving information. The fact that the CIA has morphed, if you will, from that OSS creation to now be involved in politics and policy as well as espionage and things of that. Oh, I'm sure we can't say that on public radio. But, you know, it's interesting. Did these four men, in essence, represent that transition? Oh, they did, and, and they really reflected it. 
I mean, Alan Dulles, when he was in Bern, Switzerland, really operated what amounted to a mini CIA there. He not only had his espionage operations going, he funded guerrilla movements mm -hmm. in occupied France and uh, occupied Italy. He hatched propaganda plots. He, he also inundated Washington with foreign policy advice <laughs> on how to deal with the Axis. Much of it uh, Washington ignored. But uh, you actually found in World War II, I mean, Donovan wanted to be a key player in foreign affairs. And he, over the trepidation of some of his own aides, he expanded the scope of uh, the OSS. So it was involved not only in, in collecting intelligence, it was involved in special operations, sabotage operations. It was involved in commando operations. I mean, like you see with the U.S. Special Operations Command or some of those forces that are in your neighborhood there. He was also heavily involved in black propaganda. They called it the morale branch. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he, got, he got his hands into everything. So in many ways, the CIA today, the basic structure of it, reflects uh, to a considerable uh, amount uh, the vision Donovan had for a post-war CIA. And of course, uh, things are a lot more technologically uh, right, right. you know, advanced now. We've got satellites, and Donovan didn't have that. But the basic concepts, the uh, elan of the agency, the esprit de corps, uh, it inherited uh, from, from the OSS. Our guest, and I thank you for being with us, the author of two books, Wild Bill Donovan. We started off with that uh, d description of the book, but the book I've got in my hand, Disciples, the World War II missions of CIA directors who fought for Wild Bill Donovan, all of whom, and uh, concluding on this one, uh, Ms. Waller, all of them, as you said, came a cropper. Um, all of them f left office in disgrace. Isn't it interesting? It's sad, too. It is. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. We do appreciate it. Good talking to you. Thank you again. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. Again, the book, Disciples. The author, Douglas Wallard.